In the service, we'll continue with the sermon. The sermon is based on our gospel reading from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. If you'd like to follow along at home, and for those here, you can follow along in your worship folder. We'll begin with this prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. When you're born into a family, it comes with traditions. The traditions in a family are usually based on your past. And so, if in the past your family was from Mexico, and on Christmas, it's very likely that you would have tamales, something to eat. If your family is from Sweden, you would very likely have smoked salmon, some pickled herring, which you may or may not be a fan of, and of course meatballs as something to eat. If you've perhaps grown into more of a United States way of celebrating, you're probably going to have turkey or ham, which may be true of other cultures too, but it seems to be the American way to celebrate Christmas. Traditions are something that is are unique to each family. They're based on the past, and we continue to do them because it's things that we love. It's things that are familiar, and it, it brings us together. It has become the tradition on Christmas Day to read from John chapter 1. John chapter 1 tells us about Jesus and his coming, but it is unique compared to the other Gospels from Matthew and Mark and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have those familiar things that we think about during Christmas. They talk about the genealogy of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and the angels, and the shepherds, and the manger, and all those things. John skips over all of that. He does so because John's Gospel is written later than those other three, so he presumes that you've had time to read those others and you're very familiar with all those details of Christmas. John gets right into it and he talks about Jesus, but he does so in perhaps a cryptic way. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For believers, it's clear who John was talking about. It's clear that he is referring to Jesus, who was the Word, the Word that became flesh. But for those unfamiliar with Scripture, for unbelievers, those words probably sound very foolish. There was a time, though, when those words were foolishness to us as well. You and I were like the rest of mankind. We were born to our parents. We received the gift of life from them. From our parents, though, we also received another gift, something that you would not like to find in your stocking, not under the tree Christmas morning. For our parents, we all received the curse of sin. The curse of sin it eventually leads to death. And although we are God's creation, that sin has thoroughly corrupted us and has ruined the good that God created us to be. Which is why we did not recognize the word. We did not recognize Jesus when he was born. As John wrote, he, Jesus, was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The picture here is children not recognizing their parents. It's a terrible picture. Picturing children that do not recognize, that reject their parents. Not simply the fact that they don't recognize them if that they were separated at birth and never saw them, but not recognizing that that relationship even exists. Saying, oh, sure, I, I know I have parents, but I don't recognize them as my parents. I reject them. I don't affirm that. I don't do anything in my life that acts as though I am their child. This is the terrible picture that we get. It's what we were born as. Those that rejected, that did not receive the Savior. In Luke chapter 12, 
Jesus talks about the terrible nature of being left in that condition. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. Don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of this world. He goes on. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Left as a child of this world, of your parents, left in that sin, all you have to look forward to is hell. It was a terrible condition. It was a terrible thing to be born into, into the darkness of this world, which is why God did not leave you there. He did not leave you in that terrible condition. Instead, we read in Ephesians 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. God gave you the gift of faith. With that gift of faith, we read now how you recognize your Savior. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. It was not your choice or decision to be born a child of God, as much as it was not your choice or decision to be born to your parents. What a foolish concept. You say, well, I chose to be born. It's absolute foolishness. God says it's the same with your spiritual life. God says it was his choice, his decision, that you would be born his child. He made that choice by grace because of his great love for you. Because your first birth was born to sin, to death, to hell. But you've been born again by God's wonderful grace. Spiritually, you have been reborn. Born by grace to life, forgiven, right, and good. The Son of God fought to earn the right to give you that gift of life. God's grace is a gift. It is work that he did, that he packaged up, and he has now given to you. We read in Hebrews chapter 1, the battle that Jesus fought, that the Son of God, the Word that became flesh, fought to save you. He didn't battle the long lines. He didn't battle worrying and hoping and constantly checking your emails and hoping that that Amazon shipment would come through on some silly battle like that to give you some kind of a Christmas gift. It was a real battle, real things, important things. He battled to establish good for you, and he battled against wickedness and evil and the brokenness of this world. We read in Hebrews 1, But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. These words from Hebrews 1 are actually a quote from the Old Testament Psalm, Psalm 45. Now, if you were to go and look that up, the heading would say that Psalm 45 is a wedding psalm, which is true. If you read through it, you can see the bride and the groom and the joy and all the things that would come with the wedding. So it's appropriate and would have been used at weddings. But at the same time, it is far, far more than that. It's still a wedding psalm, but it talks about the groom and his bride. It talks about Jesus and his bride, the church. In Ephesians 5, we read, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. It was the work of Jesus to make his bride had to become dirty and soiled by sin and wickedness and evil. It was his work to make her good and holy, radiant, beautiful. Jesus accomplished this, by his death on the cross, by his resurrection, giving us the new hope that one day we would be raised, that we would be given glorified bodies, that we would join him in the light of heaven. 
by Jesus' work, by overcoming death, he established his kingdom, a kingdom, as we read, that would rule forever and ever, a kingdom that would be established, that would be characterized by joy. Jesus came to live with you so that you would be able to live forever. John wrote, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The truth is that by God's grace, you are part of God's family. At the same time, though, that family is so large, it's also called a nation, a kingdom, a country. It is ruled by your father. It is also ruled by your brother. Confident in that truth, by God's grace, then, we hear these words from Isaiah. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. At one time you did not recognize the light of the world. The word of God, Jesus, who was born, who lived, died, rose, who now rules all things. There's a time you did not recognize him, but God did not leave you there. God made you his own dear child. By his will, by his choice, by his grace and love. And that grace of God then is new for you every morning. Each day you'll wake up to face new darkness, new troubles, new frustrations, new sufferings that can be in your mind, in your heart, that can affect your body, that can affect all the situations in your life in this broken world. Each day you wonder if that darkness then will cloud the light, but it doesn't. And so to be assured that the light has come into the world, continue to be in the Word. To be reminded of those great prophecies that God made thousands of years ago, the prophecies that came true in Jesus' birth, that the King came to establish His reign, His rule of righteousness and joy. John wrote, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When you were born into a family, there were unique traditions, many traditions. I'm sure you celebrated last night, this morning, and will carry on today. God also brought you into his family. And so it's been our tradition, our pattern, to read from John chapter 1 every Christmas day. To be reminded that the kingdom, the nation, the family that you are in, the future that you have, is all wrapped up in God. So that every moment of every day of your life can be filled with joy because God chose you to be born as His child. Amen.